Now if somebody tells you to open a file, you can't just type open or run. Typically, opening a file either means opening it in a text editor or executing it. First, let's talk about text editors. There are two main text editors, Emacs and Vim. Now that Emacs is installed, I'll show you the bare minimum that you need to use it. To open a file in Emacs, type Emacs and give it the path of the file you want to open. If that file doesn't exist, it'll create a new file when you save it. So let's create hello.txt. Emacs will, by default, open with a GUI rather than a terminal. If you don't have a graphical user interface available, it'll open in the terminal, though. You can type something and then type Control x Control s to save. You can see at the bottom it says wrote home sam king hello.txt. When I said Control x Control s what I meant is hold Control, type x, lift up x, then with Control still held, type s, and then you can release everything. To close Emacs, type Control x Control c if you want to learn more about Emacs, you can go through the tutorial by starting Emacs and then typing control H T. There's no control before the T. To open a file in Vim, type Vim and give the path of the file you want to open. Like Emacs, if a file doesn't exist, it'll create a new file when you save it. If you want a GUI for Vim, you can use GVim, which stands for graphical Vim. Vim is modal, so when you type normally, it'll move around rather than inserting characters. So I just press W and I move my cursor forward one word. If you want to type, you need to go into insert mode by pressing I. And then to leave insert mode, press escape. To save, type colon W. W stands for write. To quit, type colon Q exclamation point. If you want to learn more about Vim, you can go through the tutorial by running Vim Tutor from the command line. Both Vim and Emacs have large communities, both are very customizable and powerful. Vim has a bigger learning curve than Emacs, though as a Vim user I will say it doesn't take that long to get the hang of it. And you could also try other editors like Nano, but if you're a programmer or plan on spending a lot of time in a text editor, I recommend learning either Vim or Emacs. Now I'll show you how to run a file. Let me go to a directory with a script to show you how to run it. If a file is executable and your shell knows how to execute it, you can just type out the path of the file. If the file is in your current directory, you need to say dot slash before the name of the file. The reason you need the dot slash is because when you type out an executable like ls or pwd to execute, your shell will look through your path environment variable. Let's echo out path. Echo is basically a print statement for the command line, and variables start with dollar signs. So the path variable is just dollar sign path. You can see the path variable has a bunch of locations that your shell will look in order to try to find where an executable is, and dot isn't here, which is why it isn't looking in the current directory when it's trying to figure out if it can execute a file. Path doesn't contain dot for security reasons. If you're in a public directory, like the operating system's temporary directory, somebody else could create a malicious executable called ls, and then when you type ls, you think you're just going to print out the files in the directory, but instead you're going to install a virus. You can see if a file is executable by typing ls-l and looking at the permission bits. An x, like you see here, means that the user, which is in this case is me, who owns the file, will be able to execute it. You can make a file that you own executable for yourself by typing chmod u plus x, followed by the name of the file. This won't do anything, since I already have the execute permission. Now, I won't go into chmod at the moment, but you can learn more about it by looking at its manual page, man chmod. Most command line programs that you have installed should have a man page. They're often pretty dense and light on examples, so even if something has a man page, it's often a good idea to just Google the command. You can quit out of a man page by pressing Q. The second thing that has to be true to run a file using dot slash and then the name of the file is that your shell needs to know how to execute it. If a file was compiled into machine code like ls or cd, then your shell will automatically know how to execute it. If the file is a script like this one, it needs to tell the shell which program to use to execute it. 
So if we open demo script.py, you can see the first line is this. This is called a shebang line. And it says execute this using Python. So because demo script.py has the execute permission, and because it has the shebang line, we can execute it just saying dot slash demo script. Also, if you have a script, you can always just execute it using the interpreter for that scripting language. Since this is a Python script, I can run it using Python and then the name of the file. If you want to keep your files organized, you probably want to make a directory sometime. To make a directory, you can use a command called makedir, mkdir. To make a directory called demo video, I can just say mkdir demo video. To copy a file, I can use cp. You first specify the file that you're copying, and then you specify the folder to copy the file to, or the full path that you want to copy the file to, which lets you rename a file. Let me just copy demo script into the demo video folder. If I run ls on that folder, you can see that it has the demo script file in it. If I wanted to rename the file, there isn't actually a rename command, there's only a command to move files, and you can use move to either move or rename. Similar to cp, you specify the file that you're moving, and then where you want to move it to. Let's suppose that I want to both move and rename, so I'll put the file back in my current directory. Now, I don't really need two copies of the same file, so I'll remove one of them using the rm, or remove command. Beware, remove isn't like putting something in the trash on your desktop. If you rm something, it's gone. You won't be able to recover it. Make sure that you don't use rm unless you really mean it. Now, the directory that we just created is empty, so I probably want to remove that too. But rm won't work! I need to pass in the dash r flag, which stands for recursive. This will recursively delete all files in the provided directory, as well as deleting the directory itself. Another flag that you might need for rm is dash f. f stands for force. That lets you remove things that you might not want to delete, and it won't even prompt you. Again, as a warning, you can get yourself into trouble if you use rm-f, so you shouldn't use it unless you are sure you want to. Now, suppose I run a command that I don't know how to stop. For instance, if I ping 8888, which is Google's public DNS server, it'll keep pinging and it won't stop. To close most programs, you can press Control c This is called sending a keyboard interrupt. And remember, Control c is a keyboard interrupt and it won't copy. To copy something, it depends on your terminal, but Control shift c works on the terminal in, in Ubuntu, and similarly, Control shift v will work to paste. This doesn't work on all programs, though. For instance, if I open the Python interpreter and press Control c it just keeps saying keyboard interrupt. For some programs like this, Control D will work to disconnect you. You can also use Control D to close your terminal. Those were the basics that you need to get around on the command line. There are more videos, but now you know enough to research things on your own.